Okay, hello, good day, afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first module of Improving the Way We Work. Uh, and, and this one we'll focus on an introduction to continuous improvement. Uh, my name's Ian Smith. I'm Program Lead for Improvement Methodology in NHS England's Sustainable Improvement Team. Uh, and with me today is Michael Anderson, also from the Sustainable Improvement Team. Um, and we will be the faculty for today's uh, webinar. Uh, I think we might have Lynn and Claire on the call with us, but uh, Michael and I will try to double act our way through the session today. Okay, um, just uh, a quick reminder uh, for on uh, WebEx and the ways that uh, we can interact, some of the functions that we will use throughout uh, this webinar and the subsequent program. So first of all, if uh, you can see uh, that we have feedback icons. Uh, feedback icons you can see on the, um, the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, near to the attendees' names, you'll see a little hand icon. It looks a little bit like this. We'll highlight for you for you there, uh, and you can raise your hand uh, if you uh, need help or if um, if you want to speak in any of the interaction and the Q and and the Q and A. There's also a little megaphone icon. Uh, the megaphone icon next to that. If you click on the megaphone icon, it will bring up a menu of different ways to interact: uh, green ticks, uh, red crosses, too fast, too slow, uh, and applause. Um, so, uh, if we would like to try some of those out, uh, give us a green tick if you found the feedback icons on the right-hand side of the screen. We'll see whether uh, that's working for people. I'm seeing from folks that uh, seeing the megaphone icons currently greyed out. I wonder if some of our technical team could have a look at that and see if people can get some of those icons up. So, whilst they are doing that, I will move on. The chat box seems as though it is working, so we might uh, we might try that instead. So the chat box is at the um, the bottom right hand uh, side of the screen. If you can't see the chat box, there is what looks like a speech bubble at the top right hand side of the screen with the word chat under it. If you click that, it should bring the uh, the chat box up. Uh, so if you haven't already introduced yourself or you've not used the chat box, perhaps you could pop something into the chat box and see that the chat box is working for you. And if you could address in the send to box your comments to all participants, everyone will be able to see uh, your comments and we'll be able to uh, stay in touch and learn from each other. So if you'd like to pop something, there we go. That's looking good. Lots of people saying they're looking forward to the session. Excellent. That's good stuff. Hello, hello, hello to those saying hello. That's grand. Now it looks to me like the uh, the issue with the feedback icons has been fixed. So if we could test that out and see whether the megaphone on the right hand side of the screen next to the hand has come back up, and if you'd like to give uh, give a green tick or some applause or laughter in uh, in Mr. Anderson's case, that would be grand. Okay, that's looking good. It's looking like we've got some ticks going through and some smiling faces as well. That's grand. It looks like we've got the hang of it. Okay, good stuff. Uh, and the last uh, way that we will interact uh, today is using the annotation tools. You'll find those at the top left hand of the screen. There is what looks like a kind of a paintbrush or a, or a marker pen. Uh, if you click on that, an annotation menu will pop up, and there are various ways that we can interact. Uh, there is an arrow pointer, which will have your name on. There are various sketching tools uh, and text tools. And if we move ahead onto the, well, you're already ahead of me. I was going to uh, going to give us a doodle page to try this out on, but it seems that. Uh, There we go. There's a nice blank page to try some annotations for us. Well, we've got the hang of all of that by the looks of things. Very, very creative, some of you folks. Okay. If we're feeling confident with annotation, well, okay, if we, it doesn't look like we're feeling very confident with annotations, we will uh, we'll move on into the main part of the uh, this session. So we might pop those annotation tools off for now, but we will use them a little bit later on. 
So uh, today um, we're going to look at the, the introduction to continuous improvement module. Uh, now that's going to look at um, predominantly value waste from PDSA. You might remember uh, those of you who joined the induction webinar, webinar, we introduced our house diagram, which is here on the screen, which shows in the vertical pillars what we'll cover in the three sessions um, of webinars that we have planned. Uh, collectively, they'll provide a foundation for continuous improvement that can lead to uh, better quality over time. Uh, these um, particular modules are most closely associated with Lean, which is a widely used approach to continuous improvement that's underpinning the CI approach that we're promoting. Uh, and today, hopefully the highlighting will work, we'll be looking at the Value, Waste and, and PDSA or Plan Do Study Act to give it its full title uh, aspect of, uh, of the continuous improvement approach. Uh, and what we'll focus on is, uh, is these things here. So hopefully by the end of the session, we'll have introduced the methodology known as Lean, which as I say is underpinning the continuous improvement approach that we're promoting. Uh, share some examples of how Lean and continuous improvement have been used in healthcare and hopefully we'll have all discussed together via the chat box ways in which it can help your working practices. Now, I think my good colleague, uh, Mr. Anderson, is waiting to come in to take us through the next part of the session. Am I right, Mr. Anderson? Hello there. Yes, you are correct. Excellent. Uh, take us away. Indeed, like we practiced it and everything. <laughs> Excellent. If you could throw me the metaphorical ball, that would be amazing. Uh, I will carry on. Right there. there you go, sir. Excellent. Right. I'm going to talk you through the first bit of the presentation, and then we're going to try, which I think might be a first for WebEx, a sort of double act, uh, sort of radio station style. There's no wacky jingles, though, sadly. So we're going to get started. So we've got this too busy for improvement. I think this is how a lot of us feel in the NHS. So we can use some of those annotation tools now, maybe. And if you click on the megaphone, have you ever felt this way, that you're just too busy? to do improvements. You've not got the time to do them. Give me a green tick if you, you've ever felt like that, you've ever had that feeling of, oh, I'd love to have the time and space to have to think about my work, but actually I'm too bogged down in having to do the work. Great, loads of green ticks coming in there. Yes, that is sadly how we feel. Um, so what we're going to talk through today is, is where this concept of lean came from and how that can potentially help us just take a step back and have a look at what we do. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that so one of the golden rules of Lean is it's always the process, it's never the people. So I've never come across anybody in any of the many sectors I've worked across the NHS that have purposely been doing things the long way around because they want to do it the long way around. It's always because the process has been set up a long time ago and we haven't had time to look at it and it's just been botched over time and that's just what's happened. So where did this come from then? Um, so the, the history of Lean, uh, it's the the term lean was coined in uh, the 1970s, I think, um, and it came from the Toyota production system. So Toyota, after World War II, were trying to compete with American car companies like Ford, and Henry Ford had developed this thing called the mass production system. So he would produce thousands and thousands of the same car, knowing that they had the market to be able to sell them. Toyota needed to produce something different because they didn't have the market to guarantee to be able to sell cars, so they designed their process around what the customer wanted. Uh, so I think the car comes off their production line every six or seven minutes, uh, but every car has been triggered by a customer order and every car is completely different. So it could be a Yaris, could be a RAV4, could be a completely different spec, but it's all come from that initial point of a customer setting an order going. And the guy that came up with all of this stuff and is considered the founder of Lean is Taichi Ono. So um, he is the, the guru of Lean, basically. So other companies that are using Lean, um, generally any company that you can think that is doing quite well tends to be using Lean. Uh, nearly all car manufacturers use it. Um, some NHS trusts, as you can see there, TZ and Wear Valley are really big on this stuff and have implemented it strongly using the, the Virginia Mason technique as well. Um, Toyota are happy to share this, this methodology because um, so the, the first golden rule was it's always the process, it's never the people. I'd say the second thing to really bear in mind is that Lean is about 90% culture, 10% about the actual tools. So Toyota will happily tell you about their tools and their way that they've embedded them because they know that there's no way you can catch them up. You know, they're 70, 80 years down their journey now and we're potentially just starting out on ours. So it, it's impossible to try and jump ahead and embed that. 
and we'll talk about that more as we carry on during the presentation. But any company you can think of, really, um, the one I usually use, Marks and Spencers, I think was four or five years ago, were close to bankruptcy. They put some of this stuff in, and uh, they're, they're back to being sort of market leaders. So uh, there's loads and loads of tools associated with Lean. Here's just a, a huge list of them, but this is all of them. So there are lots and lots of tools out there, and we are going to try and use a poll on WebEx, okay? So we're going to stick up a poll and we're going to ask you which of these you, tools you've used, uh, if you've used any at all. So the question is, which of these tools have you heard about or even used before? You can select more than one, or you can say not used any before, or others that aren't even on the list. And if you could click your answers and press submit, that would be great. Give you a second to do that. This is where we should have that, you know, snappy back and forth, Mr. Smith. But it'll come. It'll come in time. I'm confident. <laughs> well, let, let's hope so. It's too late to back end of now. <laughs> I assume okay. you've dressed up for this WebEx. I'm sat here in a tuxedo. I don't know what you're what you're wearing. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. Okay, hopefully, great. Hopefully, hopefully filled enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, that was bad. Okay, right. Uh, Claire, if we could um, close the polling and display the results, that would be brilliant. Yeah, doing that now, Michael. Thank you very much. Nearly there. Yeah, just takes a while, as all technology does. So we'll just. Um, We'll talk about this when we come on to wastes later, maybe, that uh, waiting is quite a big one <laughs> when it comes to IT. Are the results there now, Michael? Not quite popped up on my screen yet, but hopefully they're coming. There we go. Excellent. Oh, look at that. 73% of people have used process mapping. Amazing to see. Okay, so standard operations, good. Value stream mapping, great. And very few people have said that they've not used any before, which is brilliant to see. So this is just an intro today. I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about some of those, um, obviously, Visual Control 5S and standard operations over the next few weeks. But it's great to see that uh, some of you um, have had some sort of touch on all of those tools, maybe. So moving on, what is Lean then? Well, it's this relentless pursuit for the perfect process through waste elimination. So you're looking to um, basically identify the least wasteful way to provide what you consider to be value to your patient or customer, okay? And I'd say um, through my 10 years plus experience and Mr. Smith's slightly more than 10 years plus experience, uh, we have, we would we would estimate between 75 and 95% of our times doing things that actually increase our costs and create no value for the customer. And again, that's the process, it's not the people. It's just the way that our process has been set up. They've not been set up around potentially value adding activity. And we'll talk about that in a, in a second. So this, for me, um, identifies what we're trying to do quite well in pictorial form. So on the left is, I think, where, we're, where most people feel they are now. So we're all trying to get to the same end goal. Um, so in a larger scale, uh, I think I might have talked only about this in the first one, but culturally, we're in a great position, the NHS. You know, we, co private companies would kill to have a staff base that are all employed because they want to work for the NHS. Okay, you get that nice warm feeling of saying, I work for the NHS. And you work for the NHS because you care and you want to give back to the community. Most private companies don't have that. So we've got a really strong cultural base to build on for doing this work. But actually what we have is we all want to get to the same end point, but we all do it in very different ways. Um, so you know, a generic example for this is that a nurse up in Newcastle, where Ian is, uh, might do something to very different uh, might do something very differently to a nurse would in Warwick, where I am. Um, and actually, in that ward in Newcastle, one, worth, uh, one nurse on one ward might do it differently to another nurse on another ward. And bringing it down even further, nurses on the same ward probably do things differently, and they do things in different ways to get to the same end goal. And what we're looking to try and get towards is, is well, we know what our, our best way of doing this is at the moment, and we want to standardize that, and we want to look to continually improve it. So we want to have a known approach to the way that we work. So myth versus reality. So this is really important because 
leans uh, and continues improvement have got potentially a bit of bad rep out there and just wanted to put some of this stuff to bed so lean is not sadly a tangible recipe for success you're not all going to leave this webinar today and put your headsets down or put your phones down and think wow life is great uh it works easy uh, so much less stress now it's not how it works i think it's, it's not a management system or a program and it's not just a set of tools that can be given to you and then you'll be leaned um i used to implement the productive series which some of you might have heard of which is a box set of tools that you to take out to teams and work through with them and the first question i'd always get asked was oh, how long do we have to do this for um and when the answer is forever um you're not the most popular guy in the organization so what it is is it it's a completely different way of thinking so it's changing habits and that's why that cultural thing comes into it and why it takes quite a long time to embed within people and within an organization it's uh, all about focusing on total customer satisfaction and having the right environment for that to flourish and having this never-ending search for a better way okay so you're just chipping away over and over again you're just trying to go through this evolutionary continuous improvement cycle of you know is it the best it can be or could we still improve it more and asking why and trying to challenge what's going on more so it is a, it is a very different way of working so we're going to talk a little bit about value so traditional definitions of value are it is processing that changes the shape or character of a product that's very tight you know and manufacturing okay uh, another one is activities that the customer is willing to pay for so some people in healthcare like that some people don't um so mr smith and i are perfect examples of both both opinions i think um that if i had to pay for my healthcare i would be able to understand that i'd have to hand over my hard-earned cash for every aspect but similarly he puts forward the very strong case that we don't pay for healthcare so it's quite hard to get your head around that that sense so we've but for this bottom one, any activity which improves the customer or patient's health, well-being, or experience. That makes it quite easy to think about. So, in terms of value, there are three critical dimensions of this. So there is clinical value, which is, is it effective? Is what we're doing safe and effective? There's operational, which is, you know, is it cost effective? Is it, is it saving money? Is it giving people what they want for the right cost? And finally, there's patient experience so there is um, you know are, are you getting a great experience as a patient so I'm going to get you to use your annotation tools again here if you click on the pen in the top left and get your little pointer tool I would like you bit of a leading question I know but I'd like you to try and put a, an arrow where you think value should sit okay which is the most important thank you Joe straight in patient experience clinical effectiveness we've got one vote there it's good too good Ah, uh, some crafty people going in the middle there. I can almost it's almost like they know what's coming in. <laughs> yes, Joe, you are correct. We do pay for healthcare. It comes out of our wage every month. Um so yeah, if you didn't have to pay for that and you had to pay for certain things, this is one way to think about value. Okay, thank you. I'm stop you annotating now if that's okay, please. So we've sort of plumped for patient experience, clinical safety, and somewhere in the middle, uh, which leads me on to my next, oh, sorry, Joe, I've left you on there. We'll work through that, don't worry. Next slide is, yes, we want to be looking to bring those three together and have them as our core focal point as much as we can and, and focus on that middle section, trying to cover all three of those bases. So the, I'm going to now talk to you about three types of work. Uh, some of you that I've talked to in the past will have heard me harp on about this or will have seen this slide potentially, but it is one of the most important slides we do. And this is about any piece of work that you do, and you can even take this into your home life, but let's keep it in work for now because um, you don't want to become sad like me and have like quite a lean home life. You fall into these three categories of work okay so the first one is what we've just talked about so it's anything that's value adding any activity which improves either the patient health and well-being and experience or the, the customer's experience and that's just great that's what we want to what we want to have the second one is non-value adding so this this is things that need to happen but does not directly add any value to the patient or customer's journey Okay, so for me, um, computer systems often fall into this middle category. So if I go to the GP and I've got, uh, I don't know, I, I think I've broken my leg or I've got a sore throat, 
I don't care that he's putting my information into a computer system. It's not getting me to my end goal of feeling better any quicker. Um, but from the GP's point of view, they have to do that because that is how they get paid. That's how we keep track of patients. That's how we understand medical history. So it's stuff that has to happen, but doesn't add any value. Um, I used to argue quite a lot with uh, nurses that I think cleaning a ward, in my opinion, goes into non-value adding. Because if I go into hospital with a broken leg, I just expect to not get MRSA or C. diff. Uh, I wouldn't pay you extra to not get it. And I use that example because I can guarantee some of you are there going, absolute, absolutely wrong. That's the wrong thing to do. Because it, it, is, it is not black and white, the three types of work. Okay, So this is it's, it's a little gray. And you need to define what you consider to be value and what isn't. And that, again, is where we you know, try and include service users or patients or try and include the customer in these, these discussions to understand what is value adding or what is non-value adding. And the final one is waste. So this is just something that doesn't add any value at all to anything. Uh, and it just tends to just creep in and clog up some of our systems and processes. So our main focus is to make the value adding stuff the absolute focus of every process. So maximize that as much as possible. Non-value adding, we know we can't eradicate it completely, but let's try and minimize it. Let's make that the least uh, time consuming it has to be. And finally, let's just remove waste from the process. It doesn't need to be in there. It's just crept in over time. Yes, thank you, Jody. You pay for your local swimming pool to be clean. I'd expect it to be clean. Let's not have this argument now. We'll take that offline. <laughs> okay, so waste is anything other than the minimum amount of equipment, materials, or space, or workers' time, or whatever they need is, that is essential to add value to what's happening. Okay, so there's a concept in Lean called just in time, which is having just what you need, just when you need it to be able to do your job. In the NHS, we tend to have this concept of just in case. So we'll have loads of stuff that we might not need, but just in case we'll have it. Just, just like a one-off might happen, so we need it. So we need to have that mental shift around, okay, well, waste is anything other than just what we need to do our job. It's not having loads of stuff or it's not having uh, an excess in anything. Uh, so we're going to talk you through the eight different types of wastes. I'm going to bring Mr. Smith back into the conversation and we are going to try and do a double act. Are you there, Ian? Well, I am. That's Let's a good sign. Because... Good sign. Okay, so we're going to talk through each of the wastes and then we're going to try, we're going to give you a generic example and we would love it if you could stick in the chat box your own personal examples. Could be from your working life, could be something you've experienced at the weekend that really annoyed you. Okay, so the first one is transport. So this is unnecessary movement of products or materials. So I don't know about you, Ian, but I think about transport as basically unnecessary movement of anything other than yourself as a human being. Uh, and I think the one that gets missed here fairly often is things like emails. So we do a Emails travel around all over the place. We have loads of unnecessary emails. Uh, I personally want to start a petition to ban the reply all button from any emails because uh, <laughs> it is insane. But what would you give as an example of transport? Um, as I said, it's usually any, anything that you pick up and, uh, and move around. So there's certainly lots of equipment, supplies, medications used in healthcare and hospitals. But they have to be there. They can't just magically appear where we need them. Um, but we can think about how we can get them to the right place at the right time with uh, with minimal confusion and maximum coordination. Yes. So if anybody has any examples of transport, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Okay. Well, while they're thinking about that, shall we see what the next waste we is? We shall. Inventory. So oh. easy one to think about just sort of covered this with a just in case. So it says excess mm -hmm. of products, materials being stored, but I also think about it as always running out is also a waste, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so this is having too much of something or too little of something and constantly running out. So we've got some good examples coming in. We've got uh, printing copies of meeting papers for attendees. That's a good one. Uh, that essentially falls into transport of having to send them out. Uh, we've got Rachel saying having to take the actual flip charts away with you from events when you've already taken photos. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Transport staff for meetings rather than conference calls. That is a good one. 
but we're going to get down to the next one, which is motion, which you perfectly answered with that staff meetings. So again, motion for me is ranges from a wide spectrum from the thing that you use every day from the store cupboard being right on the bottom shelf and you have to reach and stretch to the other end of the other end of the spectrum being a hundred mile round trip to a meeting and then when you get there it's cancelled. So that is well, you the doing the motion. That is the worst one. Yeah, that is really is. There's a, there's a good one in the chat box here about do you include in that the time spent walking to and from the printer? That's quite a quite a controversial one. There are different schools of thought on uh, on how best to locate printers, either the, the kind of the central big uh, super print machine, which involves a lot of, uh, of staff time walking to it, or, or smaller, more local printers uh, on the end of desks and pods. Uh, yep. It's a debate that seems to have not been resolved as yet as well. No, that's true. Well, especially because she's in Quarry House, and um, I spent mm. basically my entire life whenever I go to Quarry House just wandering the corridors, hoping to stumble across somebody I know be, that be, can point me back be, in the direction be, I need to go. Because of its unique geography, yeah. <laughs> yes, moving office location, moving between desks uh, when they aren't available. Yeah, good one. Yep, so there's some great examples coming in there. So we're going to move on to the next one, which is another easy one, waiting. So, um, Mr. Smith, give, give us an example of waiting. Well, if, if you uh, go out into uh, any, any hospital or primary care system, you'll, you'll probably find a waiting room uh, as the first thing that you see when you go in the door. Uh, we tend to kind of accept waiting as a, as a feature of healthcare, uh, but there are organisations that are starting to challenge that, think about it in different ways to try and design it out. Yep, completely agree. We could use our little green ticks here for a little test. Has anybody ever been to their GPs, walked in the front door and checked in and the doctor's been waiting for them and they just walked straight into the room? Has that ever happened to anybody? Give me a green tick if that's happened to you. Are we seeing many green ticks? Uh, I've got two. I've got a red cross. Um, two out of 100. I definitely didn't. So 2%. That's good. That's quite good. That's not bad. I'm sure that's a target somewhere. Um, yes. Joe, I went to the GPC the other day and I arrived for my half eight appointment. And uh, 10 minutes later, the doctor came in. Carrying a cup of takeaway coffee, may I add, which really got to me. Anyway, that's my own personal gripe. We'll move on. Let's. Overproduction. So making more than is needed before <laughs> it is needed. So, yes. Uh, for me, uh, a good one here is potentially um, trying, to, trying to be clever and working ahead of myself. So, you know, if I'm going to do training and I think there's going to be 30 people there because I'm confident everybody loves my training and I've printed out 35 copies of something <coughs> just in case and then I get there and there's only 10 people. That's a, it's a waste of my time. It's a waste of time in general and of resources to be printing out all of those things. So mm. that would be mine. I came across quite a, a controversial example when I was first introduced to Lean back in, in 2006 uh, working for a strategic health authority. As, as we were introduced to this stuff, we kind of went on on a waste hunt and challenged uh, everything, including uh, some reports that we used to produce every month and uh, send to the Department of Health. We thought we'd ask them what they did with them. And, uh, and without irony, they told us that they didn't do anything with them and they, they just filed them. Uh, so we, uh, we said, well, we'll stop doing that then, assuming that it was waste. Um, however, they did get quite cross at the suggestion that we would not send them their reports <laughs> to file. Yes. Yeah. Uh, people tend to not do anything with something, but if they don't receive it, they're not happy about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure that's not something that happens in our organisation, but people may have examples they want to share in the chat box. <laughs> yes, over. Oh, thanks, Liz. You're segueing us brilliantly into the next one, which is mm. over processing. So this is doing more work than is required. So we have this sort of mental block about we need to we need to give a gold standard we need to we need to give more than the customer wants but actually um, that rarely happens and it's, it's considered a waste uh, if I took my car to the garage to get a tire replaced uh, I wouldn't expect them to check over the entire engine to make everything make sure everything else was going okay I would just expect them to fix that tire uh, if I went to hospital with a broken leg I wouldn't want a full body scan I would just want my leg fixing so any examples of doing more than is required um, I don't know again, but I think reports tends to fall into this. 
pretty similar one. Can do. Yeah. When, uh, we might find some of this when we get into uh, process mapping. What I've found in the past in mapping uh, administrative processes, the, um, the, the number of steps that have the word approval written on them seems to be uh, unnecessarily high, and uh, some people consider that over process. Yes. I mean, Patrick Harrison's just maybe given the best one I've ever seen, which is uh, a leaf on the top of your coffee when they do the little fancy milk <laughs> leaf, <laughs> which is definitely going into this training presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Co co coffee has become an over-processing uh, industry in its own right, hasn't it? It has, yeah. The hundred pages. Yeah. All right, you've come to the wrong, uh, the wrong presentation <laughs> today. We've not, we've not gone near a hundred. Don't worry. We're <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next, defects. So this is rework caused by poor quality errors or, or defective processes. So having to redo something. Um, so you know, you might have um, sent an email to somebody and you realise that you haven't put the attachment on it. That's something I'm guilty of occasionally. Uh, it's a simple yeah. one. Any others? Typos in a report. Yep. Yeah. It's it's a big it's a big cause of um of what we think of as, as work demand in some systems as well. Uh particularly some of the systems where we're trying to help people solve a problem in a in a process, like IT. If we don't do that first time then people obviously come back and they chase us and we and we can sometimes count that as as new work. But it's as a result of, of having, for whatever reason, not not being able to fix things in the first place. So it's quite it's quite a big one, I think, for services. Yeah, completely agree. We've got a great mix in the chat of people giving clinical examples and everyday examples. So I'm yeah, definitely going like to be uh, saving all of this chat and using these in future presentations. And then finally, so when you and I learned, Mr. Smith, I believe there was only seven, uh, but there's there's an eight now, which it's a good is one though skills and it's a very good one for the, uh, for the NHS or any organization but I think it fits the NHS quite well so this is underutilized skills so underutilized people's talent skills or knowledge so um, having people in the organization that are experts in something but that actually has become not part of their job anymore and they don't you don't no longer do that um, you know we, potentially improvement falls into this category that we've got a bunch of people out there that nearly everybody I speak to says oh, oh I did process mapping but I did it maybe 10, 15 years ago now. I haven't done it since. So I, I'd really love a refresh on that. I'd really love a way of doing that. So we've got all these people out there that have done this and understand it and love it. I mean, everybody on here has seen those tools before, but when was the last time you got to use them? Uh, and any any examples of that would be good to see in the chat box. There are a few in the chat box uh, around uh, job creep, people forgetting skills. Uh, yeah. There's also... Um, People get used for what um, not get used for what they're good at is another one that's come through in the chat box. Yeah, being greatest. Yeah, be great. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, great. You will have noticed, hopefully, that um, all of the examples you gave don't actually pigeonhole themselves into one of those exactly. Um, there's usually overlap. It's very rare you find one that fits perfectly into one. It usually also involves some weighting or some defects or something else. So they do overlap, but every waste you can think of will fall into at least one of those categories. I'm going to come back to this at the end when uh, we go over the dreaded word that is homework. And we're going to go through these and um, that's going to be part of the work that we hope that you get time to do between now and the next session. So, as we said, waste is it's a symptom, not a cause of a problem. Okay, so we need to find and correct the different causes of waste. So we've got lean contributes, uh, a set of principles and tools um, to disentangle the various forms of waste and tackle their root causes. So it's all about trying to get down to the root cause. There's a great tool in lean called Five Whys, which is just literally just asking why five times. Um, you can sound like a really annoying child when you do it if you want. It doesn't tend to go down that well with the people you do it with. But um, once you've asked why five times, you tend to get it down to, hopefully somebody says something like, oh, just because we've always done it that way. Um, and as soon as you hear that, you think, oh, great, okay, well, we can we can question that. We can try and understand that better and we can work out why has it always been done that way and can we change it? So, okay, great. Mike, I was really good at it. Thanks, Thanks Mr. Smith. <laughs> um, so, there are loads of different causes of waste. 
Okay, uh, I'm not going to talk through all of them. I'm just going to leave this slide up for you to have a look at. The only one I'm going to bring your attention to, uh, if I can, oh, I might even try and be fancy and use the old marker tool here, oh, is cool, that one. Oh, look at that for a straight line. Poor communication. So poor communication is absolutely key, um, and communication in general is key. And it's going to be a theme that we come back to on each of these webinar series, basically. You, you can't do improvement without good communication. So, uh, you know, if you're away from your desk and somebody came in and made it the leanest desk in the world, you'd go back and put it back to how it was because no one's involved you, no one's communicated to you, no one's made clear what's happening. Um, also, you can set up things that you think everybody will understand and not communicate them, and I guarantee people won't understand them. And we'll cover that in the next webinar, but it is it's so crucial to be clear about communication and be upfront and be transparent about what you're doing to get buy-in, to get involvement in all of these things. So coming back full circle to where we started. So a bad system will beat a good person every time. Um, and that's that's not a little Lego stick man of Edward Deming. Um, he's He looks a bit different to that. But it is very true. Um, so we don't have any bad people in the NHS. I truly believe that. We have loads of good people, but they tend to be working in not necessarily bad systems, but bad uh, systems that have been there for a long time and have had to be botched because of time pressures and targets. So we've got the good people, we just need to make the systems fit them and suit them. So, <coughs> Mr. Smith, I'm going to hand back to you for a second. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we, we're, we're getting towards the end. We don't have 100 slides for those of you that pointed that, uh, that out. Uh, just a few more, but we've got here uh, the, the, uh, the, the model for improvement, which is, is really the engine that, uh, that, that drives uh, lean and most continuous improvement approaches uh, for, that, uh, for that matter. And basically what this does is provide a structured framework to help us uh, solve problems uh, and to test and implement change ideas. Uh, it's a very, very powerful system. It's quite simple to look at, made up of three questions you can see there and, uh, and, and four letters in the centre of the circle. And the questions, um, are that they're often overlooked but particularly important. So the first one of these questions in the model for improvement is, is, is what are we trying to accomplish? So really focusing on, uh, on what our aim is uh, for an improvement effort so that we know what we're about and we can focus our efforts towards achieving that aim. Uh, related to this, the second question, how will we know that a change is an improvement. And this emphasizes uh, measurements and measuring, uh, very much linked to the aim. Uh, and we're trying to figure out a small number of things we can measure, not too many, two, maybe three, usually at most, which can help us to know whether the changes we test result in an improvement uh, or not. Because I think, as we said before, um, all improvement requires a change, but not every change is going to necessarily be an improvement. So measurement can help us to determine which ones are effective and which ones less so. Uh, and the third question is, what changes can we make that might result in improvement? And it's a prompt, really, to help us identify and generate ideas that we think might make things better, uh, and hopefully measurably better at that. And you can see under there the four, the four letters that, um, that combine with these questions are, are P, D, S, and A. Uh, so not as we might note the uh, people's dispensary for sick animals, but uh, but plan, do, study, and act. Uh, and these um, these are steps in in an iterative learning cycle where when we have an idea for a change, we can plan how we're going to do it, who, with, where, and when. We can try that out. Then we can study the results in terms of how did that go? Did it go the way we thought it would go? Uh, does the metric that we're using improve as a result of what we've done? And we can decide what to do next. We can act on that information, decide whether we adopt that change, whether we need to adjust or amend it, or whether we abandon it in favor of trying something uh, different instead. So it's, it's quite a, a simple framework, but a very, very powerful one, as I say, the, the, the engine that drives continuous improvement. Uh, it can be used to eliminate the waste that we discussed uh, just a little bit earlier on. Uh, and it can do that um, by helping us um, map the process to identify and understand the problems. Uh, we can identify waste and then set specific uh, aims for improvement to eliminate the waste that we identify. We can then uh, generate ideas for, for a new or what we call a remodeled process to try and remove the waste. We can then test and improve the new process using PDSA cycles to refine it. 
and then hope we can implement uh, and sustain the gains from the, the new process that we have designed. So it's very powerful for eliminating waste, very powerful for running uh, continuous improvement projects uh, also. And we've got um, a quick um, example here. I think we'll go into this example a little bit more in detail, one of the, uh, the future webinars. Uh, but it's from some of our colleagues in, uh, in Cumbria in the northeast. Uh, they looked at their flu immunization process uh, and they mapped it out, uh, as you can see here, to identify uh, problems and waste in the process. Uh, and they, they measured it uh, as well to find that there was about 11 um, and, and a bit hours of work involved in their current state. Uh, they then decided to look at what they thought were uh, what waste, what were causing them, and see if they could redesign the process to remove uh, to remove some of those. You can see their um, their remodel process that they implemented here, uh, where they managed to do what was required in uh, 30 minutes, which meant that they um, they could implement something that sustained improvements, which was a, a, a large reduction, 95% reduction in the time taken to, to do that process, uh, saved almost 11 hours of, uh, of staff time per week. Uh, and reduced uh, errors and mistakes as well. So respectful of people in making um, a, a process a, a lot less uh, time intensive to complete uh, and also more reliable as well. So quite a good uh, example, I say. I think one we, we've got a little bit more detail on, Michael, in a, in a future uh, session. Yes, correct. We don't. So that's a quick, a quick intro to it now. We'll discuss it uh, a little bit more later on. So, I think that brings us to the end of the uh, of, of the kind of the main content on the webinar, and we've got um, as I think all of these sessions will include a, qu a quick recap, uh, read quiz to see what we recalled and retained from throughout the session. Uh, I think we're going to run these as polls, so I think I will ask Claire to put the first poll up in the background while we're considering this question. So the first question kind of goes back to the beginning of the session uh, and is asking who is considered to be the founder of Lean. And again, Michael and I will feel terribly for a few seconds while you um, you answer that question. Yeah, I mean, we can say that they, they get a bit harder. Um, fingers crossed, this is going to be 100% on the right answer, obviously, yeah, but people will get it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there may be people of a musical generation that uh, are less familiar with that. I don't know. We'll find out shortly. Uh, we we'll let Claire tell us when it looks like a good proportion of people have managed to fill it in. Yep, every lean webinar comes yeah. with a lean quiz. Looks good now. I'll close the poll. Okay, thank you, Claire. Let's uh, let's see how how we did. Is this uh, is it too late to ask you if you wrote down the answers to these questions, Michael? Aha! Look at that. It's looking good, though. It's it is looking, looking good. good. Yeah. We've got two thirds of people getting getting the right answer. I might. I'm worried I put those three people at the top off. Yeah. And, uh, made them. You, 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 you might have done. And there are people. To be fair, they might just be they might just be lean historians who understand and are familiar with Taichi Ono's obsession with Henry Ford as an inspiration as well. So to be fair. Yeah, that's very true. It's a it's a bit of a cruel question, but this one's cruel. It is. <laughs> go, go on. <laughs> you, you can have this one then. Right, so if we put up the next poll, Claire, that'd be great. So which of the eight wastes is missing? You've got movement, motion, management, or motivation? And this time we'll try not to put you off by giving you the wrong answer. So if we didn't draw attention to it uh, earlier on, there is uh, there is kind of an, an acronym. Is that what we call it? Um, it's yes. Tim Woods, which helps you to spell out the, uh, the, the, the eight wastes. Might doesn't help with this quiz, though, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, but in general, to uh, remember them, it really helps. Yeah. Well, it helps if you can remember what the M stands for, which I guess is what the quiz question is asking. So we'll see. We'll see where we go. And our folks okay. almost there. People are still inputting. Um, They're still inputting. Okay. Yeah. Maybe people are going back through the slides. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> Can they do that? <laughs> I, think, I think people might be able to, yeah. I'll close the poll now. Great, thank you. Let's see what we've got. got. Seven well, we should have done a poll as well. Should, 
should we have? What? Oh, what's the acronym? Tim Woods. Uh, Tim used to be Woods, Tim Woods. Um, but then there skills is. is the final one. Uh, Rachel's just put, put that in the chat box for you there. And it's a bit like Ask the Audience in uh, in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. You're hoping everyone gets it right. That, that looks pretty good, though. As, um, that does, yeah. Yeah. Motion and movement. Being, is, and you've, you've put a real trick question in there, I think, haven't you? It's cruel. It's cruel. But, you know, the cruel of the question, they're great at the learning. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. The anyway, move on, move on, move on. The clearer the question, the, the more the uh, audience dislike you. I think that's the rule. Uh, that's so la last last question. Uh, let's see how we do with this. So uh, we've just uh, covered it. What what do the letters P D S A stand for? Um, I know which one gets my vote, um, but we'll see what your vote is. There, the, the poll has come up. So is it pl is it Plan Day to Study Achieve? Plan to Study Act? Perform, Dance, Sing, Act? Uh, or postpone, delay, stop, apologise. <laughs> I think Rachel's asking me if um, if I'm voting. So you know, I'm voting postpone, delay, stop, apologise. That's uh, that's my preference. We we'll see. <laughs> we'll we'll see what the NHS England CI approach favourite is in a moment. There is a clue to what it isn't uh, in terms of the uh, the people dispensing for sick animals. Yeah, sadly, it's not that. I've closed the poll now, Michael. Excellent, thank you. Let's see the results. We've seen that come up. We've had a lot of padding to do in this section, and we need some jokes next week. Maybe we'll do a little green tick if you want some jokes off as red tick if you want us to shut up during these points. Mm. I, have a feeling, I have a feeling I know which way that's going to go. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of green tick. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, not what I was thinking. Well, that, that looks uh, like we've excellent. definitely got the hang of planned is for the act. So that is good. Excellent. Uh, many thanks for taking part in our in, on our quiz. It's just a little bit of um, a little bit of fun, uh, but hopefully it helps reinforce uh, some of the key points. Which are these? Uh, that was almost a, that was almost a radio link style uh, quali segue. quality segue link into the last bit. Uh, so what we could do, that there are multiple customers um, in healthcare, which is I think what we were getting at in terms of um, the, the willingness to pay definition. Uh, but a lean perspective typically prioritises the patient and for us in NHS England, I think it's, it's helpful to think about how the work that we do every day can help to prioritise the patient getting care, which is what we are all here to do. Um, patient value can be thought of as, uh, as this definition uh, from one of our past resources, any activity which improves the patient's health, well-being uh, and experience of care. Uh, and, um, and finally, it's very important that we engage with our customers to find out what matters to them. Uh, that can be very informative, uh, particularly when we're redesigning a process. As I say, with our, um, with our example of reports when nobody wanted something that we could factor out of that future process. Um, so that uh, brings us roughly through to um, to the end. There's somebody asking if we've got prizes. We need to think about that uh, for the uh, future sessions as well. Yeah. And the, the prize is knowledge is I what don't I think heard. that's going to fly. Yeah. No, I think we'll try it for today. Uh, so there's one thing left to do. We did say that there would be homework, uh, but it wouldn't be overly onerous homework. Uh, and there is a bit of homework. So we've talked a lot about waste and uh, and the Tim Woods. Uh, acronym which you can just about make out on the waste walk form and this form is available on the NHS England continuous improvement YAMA site the link for which is just popped into the box Claire's put the YAMA site link there so you can grab that uh, if you will if you follow that link you'll find this um, this word template for process waste walks and what we're asking that you, you do is take um, is, is take some time maybe 15 minutes maybe 30 minutes uh, to go and look at and observe a process um, in in, uh, in your workplace, or just take the template and think about your past experiences and these wastes and document some examples uh, that are relevant to your current or uh, or even form of working practice. Uh, and we're asking people to get involved in the Yammer network to share some of their observations on what they find wasteful uh, in our work processes. And there are two ways in which you can share those uh, those back. One is to go to the YAMR site, and we'd love to see some uh, some waste walk templates posted up on the YAMR site. And you can email them to the Continuous Improvement mailbox, which is england.ciprogram at nhs.net. Um, 
So whilst we're thinking about that as a question, yeah, are the slides going to be shared? Uh, yes, they, they will be. We're uploading the slides to the NHS England CI SharePoint page. Uh, if you've not uh, been to that page, uh, it's worth uh, it's worth checking out the slides from the induction webinar. There, this one will be uploaded after this session and future sessions as, as well. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, for all of the terrible jokes that we've done there, we're calling the sessions, uh, and they'll be available on the end so as uh, as a video if you need to recap, uh, or if you found the jokes good enough, you want to recommend them to a colleague who sadly gets them on the day. Uh, so all of the materials will be available. Uh, it would be great if you could find 15 or 20 minutes to document some waste and share them before next week's session, and we'll bring some of those back. So, um, cool. Sorry, I was just going to say, if you've never been on Yammer before, it, it just works sort of similar to Facebook or social network right. sites where you just need to log in, and if you click that link and you've never been on it, it'll ask you to register. But once you've registered, you can either go back and click the link, or you can search for um, CI north pages or ci um, program pages and it'll it'll come up easy to find if you do have any problems i'm sure if you email the england.ci program at nhs.net they'll be more yeah. happy to help the, t the team will help you out they're, they're looking to build up the ci network through yammer so they'll definitely be up for helping you uh so at this point uh we're, we're pretty much um ready to close but we've maybe got a minute or two for any questions if anybody wants to put something into the box we will try and answer it before we um describe what's going to be happening next week and we'll leave you on your way oh many thanks Lynn stanley fabulous session uh you must like terrible jokes but thank you very much much appreciated uh <laughs> If, if your laptop's a problem, Mary, that's a little bit beyond us, uh, but hopefully the IT folks can help you with it. Fingers crossed. That, that, that's the way. Thank you. They're into the way. Sorry. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, people are definitely getting into the swing of things. Great. Just got to do our promo now. Yes, indeed. Just before you go, um, Next week, which will be Tuesday, the 12th of June, I think same time, 2 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken, and we will be looking at the second module, which is Visual Control and 5S. So I hope that you've enjoyed the session today. Uh, when you close the screen, I think there will be a survey to, um, to give us feedback on both what you think you've learned uh, and how the session went, and that would be great. It will help us to, um, to improve for future cohorts. So if you could fill that in, that would be grand. And then I think all that remains for us to say, Michael, is thank you very much. Goodbye. And we hope to connect with uh, you all next Tuesday. Yes, completely agree. There'll be a, a world's first attempt at a virtual game next week that's never been done virtually with such numbers. So you know, if you want to be part of that, I can't promise we'll be in the world record books, but it's going to be exciting either way. So no, tune in I that. can promise that the jokes will be just as bad, but it will get more interactive. So do have a good day, folks. We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks all.